this is a quite <coughs> radical change in direction. Um, I've, I've become involved or re-involved in working with and thinking about the intangible heritage recently over the last um, half a dozen years or so. And I was in, involved in this project in Mongolia, which, which for me was a really transformational project to be involved in, partly, or, or I think largely, because of the people that I was working with and the way that the thinking that we were all involved in developed over the course of the project. And I'm, I'm just trying to share a little bit, bit of that with you. It's very light on theory because I'm not much of a theoretician, but it's heavy on practice because that's what I do. And I think that I've then come back around in that thinking process to come up with some thoughts and some challenges about how we think about and how we theorize about intangible heritage, which then might prove useful later on. So if we move on. The project is at Oyu Togoi, which is a operating gold and copper mine in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. The right-hand map, uh, sorry, the left-hand map, well, the little map shows you Mongolia. The other two then zero in to show you where Oyu Togoi is, which is about four or five hours drive due south of Ulaanbaatar, out in the middle of the Gobi Desert. Fascinating place to go. It is everything that it should be if you've seen the films about Genghis Khan, and Genghis Khan really is the national hero. It's, it's a, it is a vast plain. It is also extraordinarily arid, and it has a, a, a very simple, low, um, dispersed grass climate, and that's it. There's nothing else there. Plat plain interrupted by these serial ridges of rocky, low rocky mountains. Fascinating place, and it is really the home of the nomads. So the Gobi Desert and the Khan, the Genghis Khans, that is the culture that's been there for the last couple of thousand years. And that's a theme which plays point and counterpoint to the project all the way through. Because, of course, being a gold mine or a copper gold mine, it's a very specific place. And in the minds of both the mine's proposers and the government's regulators, and then also then the whole of the consultant team like myself, we end up dealing with places. And that's something that doesn't really work doesn't play out very well with intangible heritage. So uh, this is a bit of background about the project. So we started off with um, an, an impact assessment with trying to get across the, uh, the real understanding to the real people on the ground in the Sums and the villages that we're not there, we're not able to try to preserve things. That come what may, the world is changing. And out, even out in the middle of the Gobi Desert, the world is changing. So we're not there to preserve and save everything. We're there to help them try to understand and manage the process of change that they are a participant in. They can try to choose to ignore it, and it'll happen anyway, or they can engage. And that's one of the ways of thinking that we were trying to get them engaged in. And, of course, they were then saying things like, well, we don't want to lose our traditions. They also didn't want to lose their tangible things. They didn't want to lose the archaeology. So we'll come on that. So they, they were already there in much of their thinking in some ways. And in other aspects, they also needed to recognize the limitations on what was possible and what was going to be achievable. Uh, th this is one of the things which, which occasionally can cause a consultant nightmare. So when I started, I thought I was going to help develop a program for the intangible cultural heritage to do with this um, gold mine. But if you read the second part of the objective, um, the goal for the OT OU Tolgoi cultural heritage program is to serve as a model for the country. Now, if that doesn't give you sleepless nights, I don't know what will. And so credit to my, my two project directors, one of whom is here, that actually was one of the real outcomes of this, that the process of working through tangible heritage, intangible heritage, paleontology, and a range of other things, was to put us and the government officials we were working with in a position that all of them changed their way of thinking, and that led to a change in a way of practice. And it is, as always, a, method, a matter of finding a balance between what is impacted, what is affected, and most importantly, what is valued at the receiving end. So it's not so much about preserving places, and that's back to that concept of a specific geographic place, but about 
preserving aspects of the lifestyle that they felt were important. Not what we thought was important. And I, I love that, some of the aspects of Nadia's paper. So having studied pottery once upon a time, it wasn't the profile, it wasn't the rim that I'd always thought was so important that was important to the potters. Well, it was like that all over again out in Mongolia. I went in with some preconceptions and that didn't, my preconceptions didn't match. They didn't matter to the Mongolians. Well, the three, again, to keep this into perspective, so the project overall had to deal with cultural heritage in its broadest, widest definition. So it was the tangible resources. There was a very intensive archaeological program, which I'm not going to talk about at all. There was a very intensive public, public education and public presentation program, which I'm not going to talk about at all. But there was also, alongside those two, a program to deal with the intangible resources. And the three of them then had to come, had to start together, split apart, go through the course of a project over some numbers of months, and then come back together again at the end. Okay, so archaeology, there's all the usual things. Most of you are archaeologists, I presume. So there are all the usual artifacts and sites and forts and settlements and burials and so on. There is also the paleontology. There's, there's a fascinating, a turn digression one moment. There was a fascinating site with thousands of dinosaur footprints still preserved on the surface in the sandstone, and you sort of walked across them. And for an idiot like me, that was just astonishing. So that is trying to, I'm try, all I'm trying to do here is to impress upon you the diversity of things which were there, and all of which were valued by the local community, and to differing degrees by us as archaeologists, paleontologists, educators, museologists, and so on. The intangible resources also prove to be quite daunting, because I remind you, these are the Gobi nomads. This is a culture which for two or three thousand years has not had a fixed place. It is a culture which is very rich in many different ways, but it's all transportable. And in a, in a degree that I had not previously experienced before and not really since, these were people to whom intangible heritage is heritage. This is what was important to them. They had learned to value the places, and in some ways, not always the way we would perhaps, and not always for the reasons we would, in terms of explaining how the culture got to where it is and so on, but, but they did understand them. But this, to, to me, in my way of, of working with them, they really understood the way that all the things of their lives fitted together into a mobile, intangible heritage. So they have a diverse range of customs, which are variously under threat from modernization, like wrestling. And my co-director of the Intangible program was a former national champion of, of uh, Mongolian wrestling. In fact, his, his nickname was Elephant. Big guy, never argued with children. Language, they wanted to make sure that they kept the aspects of their language which they felt made them distinct, not just from people like me coming in from outside, not just distinct from the hundreds of thousands of Chinese who are coming across the border to work in the mine, but the things which made them distinct as residents of the Om Nagobi, the, the part of the Gobi Desert, which is only part of Mongolia. They are intensely proud of those things which they see as forming their social identity. Dances, I've got pictures of, of, of more of these things down, down as we go along. The songs, fascinating, the Earth and Dee, the long songs of Mongolia are their way of learning, retaining, and transmitting the whole of the history of the Mongolian people through song. Absolutely fabulous. A range of festivals. They are mm, sort of essentially Buddhist, sort of. Um, they really don't like evangelical Christians. They really don't like anything which is too strongly based that way. They are a very moderate people in that way. So they have their own forms of Buddhism. They also have a very extensive range of shamanistic practices, rituals that they practice at places. And I'll show you those again in a minute. So I'm trying to give you a diversity of just intangible heritage that exists. Festivals and then the sacred places and the rituals. So to carry on, a huge range of things. That's just to show you a couple of the different ways that it was divided in the one box in the center is sort of Chulun Sample Dondo is the director 
my counterpart from the Mongolian Academy of Sciences Institute of History and Archaeology, as it is now. Uh, so Chulun and I were the ones leading on the intangible heritage, and then over here is Jeff Altschul, who was the, the project director overall. Well, Jeff's expertise, this is for Jeff, because he was doing, uh, at the end of much of the archaeological work, producing some of the mapping of, of uh, sensitivity and impacts and potential impacts on, on tangible resources. Uh, another uh, really quite striking sight was to arrive at this one, walk out, stand on top of the hillside, and then suddenly realize that all the rock of the hill that I was standing on was in fact worked flint. Millions and millions of sherds of worked flint of, of various degrees of finishing from rough cores to finished cores to flakes to finished artifacts. So a lot of archaeology, there's archaeological sites like this one, which is still standing in three dimensions um, with, with good vertical stratigraphy, and it's immediately adjacent to another site, which I'll show you in just a moment. And the purpose there is simply to show, once again, we're entering a point where there is a indel in, uh, an indelible link between places and thinking, between places and and, and emotional values, and it becomes difficult for a number of reasons to separate the two, and it may in the end be un unproductive to try. Silversmithing is one of the things which they valued extremely highly because, of course, it produces something which is transportable. And these bowls are important, believe it or not, not because they're made of silver, it's not that they don't recognize that silver is a valuable metal, but they're valuable because the motifs which are engraved on the rims are motifs handed down from one craftsman to the apprentice to the next generation and so on, sometimes through family lines. And it's that connection between the craftsman and the family for whom it was made that makes the bowl valuable. So here, to follow on my, one of my personal themes in this paper. We have a place where a craftsman lives and works. We have a place where the recipient family resides. And then we have a, a large range of networks which connect those two and then other third parties. And to the Mongolians, it's those networks which are the most important. That Buddhist monastery is immediately adjacent to that archeological site with its ruined walls that I showed you just a moment ago. This has obviously been rebuilt. The purists among us might have some quibbles to say about the way in which it has been restored, which mattered not at all to most of the locals because they didn't care. It was made using modern cementitious mortar. I wouldn't do that. They didn't care. What was important to them was to have that functioning monastery back again. And that a, a bit of a disjunction there persists because the archaeological site is right in front of it, right along the axis of approach for the, the putative tourists that they would like to have come. It is therefore in the direct impact zone, and it's, it may be recognized in one way as being something old, but we might then want to impose upon it the value of saying, actually, that's what's going to tell us, that's the place which is going to tell us when the monastery was built and who built it. Well, they didn't care. They just wanted to have a place to go on carrying out their own ritual practices. Perfectly right. Um, sacred places, well, the, the middle photo there is actually one of the rocks from which I took the photo in, you saw just a moment ago. And the lower photograph there shows those practices still being carried on at that site on the day we visited a few years ago. So the question we're all revolving around this because it's practice. I'm a practitioner rather than a theoretician. Is what is it we're going to protect and how are we going to try to do that? How? What? The sacred places, they call them, that, well, the name they arrived at through the course of the project was Ufskar Rud, which means basically a sacred place. Um, and you've got two examples there of a type of a Ufskar Rud called an ovo which is a low rock mound with a stick sticking out of the top upon which they would then attach particularly blue cloths because that's the mode, that's the medium that they use to make prayers. And the interesting thing about most of these was that the place wasn't important. The place wasn't important to them at all. It wasn't the positions in which either of these two mounds were found which was important. What was important was that was the place they went in order to make a prayer to a god who was somewhere else. And, and to be honest, I, I never 
for all of my efforts, never quite got to understand why those places were then the focal point for making the prayers. Because they did know that the God to whom they were trying to make a prayer was located in the mountain, which is over there on the horizon. But they didn't go there, they went here. So, and I'm, I'd love to be able to explain that to you, but I can't. Just, to, I never got there. But this is also the Uskadrud. This is still that same monastery of which they were, they were so proud, and the restoration works that they had done upon it. So, in the right-hand photograph, notice the monk in saffron robes sitting on top of the rock, meditating. Very, very much a living thing. Well, the Yurt and another thing which, which we were deeply involved in was the Mongolian long song, the history songs and dances, which they used to convey their history to everyone else, which up until very recently were entirely oral. So the transmission was orally, generation to generation. And this gentleman was one of the first, certainly um, one of the, of the very few people to attempt to write them down during the long period of Soviet domination of Mongolia. And he's showing us his first attempts to write down the, the, the lyrics of the Urthendi long songs, which are now increasingly being transcribed. They are increasingly being recorded, and that's part of the outcome of the project, of course. But it, up until, so this is five years ago, up until then was almost still an entirely oral tradition. And that was important to them. And so then you've got here and again various photographs of of the singers, male and female, and the musicians and the dancers and so on, performing the arts indeed. And this is not something which is abstruse to the Mongolians. They all understand them and they all participate in them. And the top right hand photograph is a display, a, a sort of a, a concert going on in the main square in Ulaanbaatar. Um, and and it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't an unusual thing. It was the sort of thing they do to celebrate their heritage. Well, the problem that we were facing, we'll come back to reality here, is that with all of this going on, with all this heritage sitting out there, the reality is that there, that this heritage is taking place on a landscape which is one of the world's richest in rare metals and minerals. And therefore it is also one of the most uh, potentially impacted places you can imagine. And they have, as many places do, relatively good sounding laws. Thank you. So catch the, the bit in red, compliance. Nice sounding law is just not being done. Sorry, so that it's 18 minutes gone. You're right, that is confusing. Okay. Um, all right, I'll, I'll try to speed up a bit. So the risks and opportunities, it's the usual thing you do, but just look down the thought, the threats. This is what came back to us. And look how that's focused on the intangible heritage. Now, th this, is, this is actually some of the lists. This isn't just the ones I was asking. So this really is the way they were perceiving. They were very, very concerned about the loss of their own culture. And that meant that it had to become a key part of the intended outcomes for the cultural heritage program. How many, um, 20 minutes, right? Sorry, Corey. Okay. Um, right, we're going to really speed up here. So amongst the outcomes had to be some way of understanding and measuring what was important to them and how the works of the mining companies could be structured so as to achieve an outcome which was socially acceptable. The implementation plan, you love this? Is this not great? I couldn't change it. I mean, all I could do, Jeff, was overwrite it a bit. So, um, and, and this, is the, this is the outcome of, of two guys sitting down and, and one of them drew it out on the back of an envelope and it was edited and this is what the consequence is. The important bit is the new, encircled in red, are things which didn't previously exist and equally but unobtrusive are a series of green lines. And that's important because the green lines would be money without which you don't get mining companies to do something and without which you don't get the physical practical outcomes that we would all want for any of the various forms of cultural heritage out there. So this is the point at which theory really does meet practice and trying to come up with um, an institutionalized way of making heritage management in these forms real and repeatable and sustainable. So we came up, or they came up with this as a great idea. We then presented it as a report and it was it was really warmly received. This is I mean this is endless rounds of consultation 
with, I know, I'm going to stop in a minute, sorry. And a, a lot of consultation and a lot of then, because of that, a lot of support. And unfortunately, it then all came to a grinding halt. And because there was this thing called a global economic crisis, the mining company was in trouble, and the Mongolian government, in a really classic shoot-yourself-in-the-foot kind of way, decided to unilaterally renegotiate the mining license to increase the government's income at the cost or at the expense of the mining company's income. The mining company withdrew, and it all went into hibernation, except for one really important thing, and that is that diagram, that beautifully lurid purple diagram actually led to a change in the national legislation. So that the, the, the core parts of that idea of how to make cultural heritage management repeatable is now there enshrined in law. One can hope that the rate of compliance and enforcement will be better. At least the mechanisms are in place to do so. One more minute. Is that all right? Yeah, okay. The only important, because what was, in, what was in, entrancing me throughout this whole thing is, is the conflict between place and value. Because the mining company wanted to know, wh where is all this stuff that we've got to preserve? Where's that, where's that silver bowl? And we're trying to say, it's not the silver bowl that's important, it's the craftsman. Okay, good. Where's the craftsman live? Well, he lives in that village. Okay, so we got to, but that village is not in the impact zone. So it doesn't matter. Well, no, actually it does matter because you're doing a huge mine, you're importing hundreds of thousands of people, you're, trans, you're creating a brand new town in the middle of the Gobi Desert, you're changing water supply systems, that has effects on that village where the silversmith works. You do the same argument with the long song singers and dancers and the knuckle bone and the archers, sorry, they have a game called Knuckle Bones, uh, which actually has national championships and knuckle bones, it's fabulous, and the archers and and every other single form. And you had to make the argument that it's not always the place that's important, it's the values placed upon it. And that requires us to move out of a way of thinking that we as archeologists and, and the engineers that we were working with and the architects we were working with and the government administrators we were working with, none of us had a developed lexicon for dealing with that multiplicity of levels of importance which didn't tie neatly to a map. And in one way, to me, that's the biggest challenge that now remains for the next iteration of the Cultural Heritage Program in Mongolia. So I'm really sorry, I went over time. And you're back on track. Okay.